Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Our order of service is order, the order of divine service setting two. Our opening hymn is hymn number 487. Come you faithful, raise the strain. Let us stand for our opening hymn. God's blessings upon our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory, Lord Jesus Christ. Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer for you.
Let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Acts, the third chapter. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor, he has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. From the first letter of St. John, the third chapter. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for our hymn of the day, hymn number 483, With High Delight, Let Us Unite.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this afternoon, today's gospel from Luke chapter 24. In the name of Jesus, amen. I suppose it could be said that our outlook on life, at least in part, is a byproduct of the period of history known as the Enlightenment. In the Enlightenment, mankind had finally come of age. We brushed off the vestiges of superstitious thought and came to believe that human beings could do virtually anything they set their minds to. Prior to this, humans had generally accepted certain realities even though we had no visible evidence to support them. Since the Enlightenment, our race has come to anchor our beliefs in what can be observed scientifically. Science has an answer for everything, or so we've been led to believe. In the Enlightenment, we also became self-sufficient. We've come to esteem in others those qualities that exhibit the power of the human spirit to overcome. Our heroes are the self-made man, the self-starter, the self-motivated, the self-sufficient. I even read an article some time back attacking the Cinderella character as one who was too spineless to overcome her own problems. And so we live each day in this sort of environment, this philosophical climate, in which the world around us exalts the self and diminishes the need for others. Even our Christian work ethic moves us to accept, at least in part, the flawed proverb that God helps those who help themselves. We strive not to be dependent on anyone or anything because dependence is considered, at least by my generation, to be a serious character flaw. And yet, there is one who places us precisely into the seat of dependence. There is one who teaches us that our very life is defined not in self, but in him who loved us when we were unlovable, who carried our cross when we couldn't bear it ourselves, who gave us life when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, who says to us, if you are not dependent on me, you have no part in my everlasting kingdom. Indeed, there is one who takes us back to those pre-enlightenment days when we believed what God's word implanted in our hearts, namely that Jesus is our Lord, that his will for us is perfect, that his salvation is complete, and that his word is in all its parts beyond reproach. What we see in today's gospel that depending on Jesus is the most reasonable thing for us to do. For we see here four distinct things that the risen Christ did for his disciples and continues to do for his disciples to this very day. So let us proceed to answer the question, what does the risen Jesus do for you? Well, first, he dispels your superstitious thoughts. Luke writes, they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. When the risen Jesus first appeared to his disciples, they really didn't know what to think. Is this a spirit? Is it a ghost? Are we done for? They knew Jesus had died. They'd heard him cry out his last words as he committed his spirit to his Father in heaven. 
They'd seen his lifeless body taken down from the cross. They watched him being carried away to be laid in a stone-cold grave. But now they were seeing him again, and they thought he was a ghost. Now, God had already taught his people not to fear such things as spirits or ghosts, that there's no communication or contact between the living and the dead. But here they are, overcome by superstition, and Jesus calms them by assuring them that he is, in fact, real. He's not a spirit or a ghost. See, my hands and my feet, he says. Touch me and see. He was real. He was flesh and blood. He had truly risen. And with that touch of his body, their superstitious thoughts abated. For he was alive. Truly, physically alive. Now, I I know we'd all like to think otherwise, enlightened people that we are. But our hearts are plagued by all sorts of superstitions too. We fear things that we have no business fearing. For our Lord Jesus is risen from the grave in body and soul. And we too look to this risen Jesus, this one who is both divine and human, who is flesh and blood, the one on whom we are so dependent to dispel our superstitious thoughts and fears. To his disciples, he he said, handle me and see. To you and me, he says, take and eat. This is my body. Beloved, this is real. Jesus truly is risen and is truly here today in flesh and blood given for you. Jesus has attached himself to physical elements we can see and feel and thereby dispels our superstitious thoughts and fears just like he did for those apostles all those years ago. Secondly, he controls the emotions that can get in the way of faith. Luke says, and while they, were still, or while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Emotions are funny things. They aren't the essence of faith, but they certainly play a part in it. In the resurrection of Jesus, we're called to joy and happiness. We're called to lift up our hearts, to celebrate what his victory over death and the grave means for us. We're chosen people, not frozen people. Emotions of faith are a good thing. But emotions are not the standard or foundation of faith. In fact, they can be a downright detriment to faith. The risen Jesus once again intervened in the lives of his disciples, for they were for a time overcome by joy and astonishment. Luke says they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. Their emotions got in the way of their faith. Jesus brought them back to faith by assuring them again of the reality of his physical bodily resurrection. Have you anything here to eat? He didn't need to eat, mind you. But he did eat. 
to calm those emotions that had gotten in the way of his disciples' faith. He does the same for you, beloved. His word does not change. It's an anchor in an otherwise turbulent sea of emotions. Faith comes by hearing that word, Scripture says. God sees to it that your faith rests not on the way you feel, but on the one who is risen from the grave, who reigns over heaven and earth, who graces you with his word and sacraments that you might have an undying faith in him. Thirdly, he continues to grant you forgiveness for your sins. We read in verse 47 that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. It seems at times like a redundant message, I know. But you need that assurance, beloved. And to have it, it must be preached over and over again. So here it comes again. The same God who calls you to repentance freely gives you his forgiveness through faith in Christ. In Christ, you are declared not guilty of all sins. For Jesus was found guilty in your place. There is no sin he has not atoned for. There is no guilt he has not carried. There is no punishment he has not already suffered. These things, like Jesus' resurrected body, are real. For Jesus commanded them to be preached to all nations. Finally, calls you to be his witnesses. You are witnesses of these things, he says. And who better to be a witness to the grace and mercy of God than those who've received that grace and mercy so abundantly? You are his witness, my friend. For you are one who confesses your complete and total dependence on him. The Enlightenment taught us to believe that we belong to ourselves. That we are the self-sufficient heroes we so admire. But Jesus' resurrection refutes that sort of thinking. Quite to the contrary, we desperately need this risen Jesus in our lives to dispel our fearful fearful superstitions, to control the emotions that get in the way of our faith, to forgive our sins, and to call us to a life of witness, to give purpose and meaning to our lives. Oh, how we need this one who places us precisely in the seat of dependence, who teaches us that our life is defined not in self, but in the one who loved us when we were unlovable, who carried our cross when we couldn't bear it ourselves, who gave his life when we were dead in trespasses and sins. Yes, there is one who takes us back to those pre-enlightenment days when we believed what God's word instilled in our hearts. His name is Jesus. He is our Savior and our Lord. His will for us is perfect. His salvation is complete. And his word is in all its parts beyond reproach. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing if you're able as we continue now with the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. As the Board of Stewardship continues to present activities and groups that God has inspired to serve others and honor Him, I'd like to introduce our dear sister Juliet, who serves on our food pantry team. Good evening. Good evening. I've been a member here all of my life and been involved in a variety of activities over the years. But until I started helping out with our food pantry a few years ago, I didn't have any idea of how it really worked. <clears throat> I knew that many faithful members of our congregation and from Peace and Nina regularly donated money and food. Our family would be sure to bring food for the holiday food collections, but I never thought about the logistics of how the food is distributed to the people that need it. I also had no idea how much an impact this ministry would have on me and my faith walk. Here are a few of the things I have learned. The people who use Trinity's Food Pantry are people of all ages and backgrounds. Some are members of either Trinity or Peace congregations, but the majority are people from our community. Whether they're working but can't make ends meet, unemployed, or suffering from an illness or disability, our Food Pantry is here to help. We serve anyone who comes. We don't ask a lot of questions when they register, just their names so we can keep track of how many packages we need to prepare twice a month. It's a great feeling to know that I am part of the ministry that hel helps make life a little better for them. I'm reminded of the Bible verse from Matthew 25, 35. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. Many times, People are embarrassed to be receiving a handout. Although we welcome anyone in need, there can be an underlying element of shame for those who come. I always try to keep in mind 1 Peter 3.8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. I make sure to greet each person with a smile and make them feel welcome to reassure them that they are not a burden and we are happy that we can help them. I remember one single mother who had lost her job telling me while holding back tears how difficult it was to be accepting food because she and her kids had always donated to local food drives and the homeless shelter. She never thought that she would be in a situation where she would be receiving food from the food pantry. There are a few people I've gotten to know pretty well who stay in con contact with me outside of food pantry distribution days, people that God has put in my life to love and encourage and to teach me compassion and patience. We also have a lot of helpers. From those who faithfully donate food, money, or bring in extra produce from their gardens, sort food and stock shelves, especially after a food drive like the postal workers' spring food collection, to the faithful crew that come every second and fourth Saturday morning to stuff the 40 or more boxes and bags full of goodies, 
and then brave all kinds of weather to help the, with the drive-through distribution in our back parking lot. As it says in Ephesians 4.16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. My favorite thing about working for the food pantry are the connections I've made with both our patrons and fellow workers and for the friendships that have grown while sharing God's love and provision in a tangible way. What a blessing it is to be a part of this ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. And thanks to all who are involved with the food pantry, along with those who provide the various gifts needed to sustain the families that need our help. Many thanks as well to the local organizations who donate products to help the needy, many of whom, most of whom, uh, prefer to remain anonymous. God be praised for our food pantry ministry. If you're able now, please rise and we will continue with the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in your presence we find fullness of joy, and by your right hand, Christ Jesus, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sins and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of his salvation and confident hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Heavenly Father, by the incarnation of your Son and the reconciliation of his cross, you have made us your children and gathered us into your holy church. Sustain the preaching of your holy word and its message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, among us and all the nations of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Give peace, Lord, to our homes and enliven them by Christ's resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sins reign among husbands and wives, parents and children. Assure those who live alone that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, preserve our nation and its leaders, especially our presidents, our governor, and all who make and administer our laws. Preserve order and decency in this fallen world by their hands and restrain the sins and deceptions of the lawless that we may practice righteousness while awaiting the eternal peace promised in Christ's wounds alone. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, as your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, give your presence and comfort to the troubled in our midst, especially Tom Drum, Janine Jandry, Sherry Bricko Tobin, Michael Hastings, Jim Whitman, Bud Shergi, Carlton Borkert, Merle Weber, Shelley Holowinski, Pastor Michael Allmeyer, Dennis Durkey, Jackie Kislewski, Levi Cruz, Joyce Virtue, Pastor Tim Kinney, Michelle Mahoney, Jeff Dion, Sue Maynard, Donna Meese, Virgil and Judy Bender, Sally Bolin, Kathy Rigotti, Sylvia Schultz, Diane Olson, Frank Erdman, Blaine Henkel, Alan Monteufel, Debbie Monteufel, Judy Watkins, Shirley Fleischer, Dan Shale, Ann Keller, Jeannie Juvi, Walter Brinkman, Jerry P. Otter, Roman and Flora Tarenko, Lana Gast, Scott Donchi, Sandy Romer, Scott Steenport, Norb Pomerenke, Brooke Schrader, Judy Krause, Lynn Olson, Mike Godwin, Rick Stanford, 
Mona Barkey, Scott Henriksen, Mary Voigt, Rose Kozlowski, Alice and James Thurber, Carrie Lindner, and Joan Reinke. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family of Matilda Carol Evelyn Edwards, with the blessed joy of Easter morning. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Bless those celebrating birthdays this week, Nord Pomerenke, Nathaniel Boss, Jean Zeinert, Brad Borgen, Kimberly Henriksen, Kyle Whitman. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Grant your continued blessings on our food pantry as we endeavor to care for the least of these as you, O oh Father, care for us. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your Son's crucifixion, all sins have been blotted out. Send us now the blessed refreshment of his bodily presence in the sacrament of the altar, and make us fit partakers in repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, only Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying he has destroyed death, and by his rising again he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. 